On December 19th, 2018, during the busy run-up to Christmas, an unknown person or group launched a series of highly coordinated excursions into the UK's second busiest airport with multiple highly maneuverable and highly modified drones. Over the course of three days, these drones wreaked havoc on millions of travellers, closing the airport for over 33 hours, cancelling more than 1,000 flights, affecting 144,000 people, playing cat and mouse games with airport security and the police, and evading military-grade anti-drone countermeasures before disappearing without a trace. Despite millions in lost revenue, cancelled flights, police mobilisation, and expensive investigations, not one verified photo has ever been captured and the Department of Transportation has admitted, through repeated Freedom of Information requests, that they do not even have any reports of the drone's size or description, leading many drone enthusiasts and experts to believe that there were never any drones to begin with. This has led to counter-theories ranging from corporate conspiracies to mass panic to police cover-ups of state-sanctioned cyber-attacks to the truly, truly weird. Come with me as we take a deep dive into the mystery of the Gatwick drones. Day 1. It's 9pm on December 19th, 2018, a bus stop just outside London Gatwick. A security guard is leaving work when he sees what he believes to be two drones hovering just inside the Gatwick complex. It's a rainy, gloomy night in December, so he can't offer a detailed description of what he sees, but he notes that they are glowing, as if affixed with bright lights. One is seen zipping along the perimeter fence, and the other is actually inside the terminal, hovering just over a vehicle. In recent years, drones had become a major worry around airports due to the fact that a drone collision can potentially cause great damage to the wing of a commercial aircraft, also because they can potentially be used to launch terrorist attacks. So, with this in mind, the security guard immediately notifies Gatwick's air traffic control tower, and within minutes, action is taken, and Gatwick's main runway is shut down, and all flights are either suspended, diverted as far as Paris or Amsterdam, or just straight up cancelled. Gatwick then contacts Sussex Police, theorising that the drones are likely being controlled by someone nearby. Sussex Police and Gatwick Security search the area immediately outside the airport. Twenty vehicles drive around the perimeter with their lights flashing, presumably in the hopes of either scaring any nearby operators away or just catching them in the act. However, they find no perpetrators nearby, and despite their presence, the drone sightings continue to grow. Within the space of half an hour, there are six more reports, five by police. It's 9.30. Sussex Police take operational control and launch what will soon become known as Operation Trebo, and for the next few hours the police and airport staff play a game of cat and mouse with the unknown person or persons responsible. A pattern begins to emerge. The drones are sighted, the airport is shut down, the drones appear to leave, the airport starts readying the runway, another sighting is reported, everything is shut down, etc. By now, 58 flights have been cancelled. Another attempt to reopen the runway at 12 o'clock, but when an inspection vehicle is sent out to check the runway, the driver spots a drone. At this point, staff and police believe that whoever is controlling the drones must also have access to Gatwick's radio or flight radar, and a clear intention of shutting things down. The drones appear periodically for the rest of the night in hourly intervals except for a brief reprieve at 3am. Gatwick attempts to reopen the runway again, but after 45 minutes, of course, the drone is again sighted by the runway inspection vehicle. Day 2. The sightings cease at 9am on Thursday the 20th of December, exactly 12 hours after the drones first appeared. At 9.30, a thoroughly defeated Sussex police call in help from five other police forces. A helicopter and several drones are also deployed. Throughout the rest of the day, a series of military trucks will arrive from the Army and the Air Force, as well as several vans carrying counter-drone superweapons and assorted civilian contractors. At 10.20, Sussex police tell the press that they don't think the incursions are an act of terrorism, but they do believe that they are a deliberate attempt to disrupt air travel during the busy Christmas season. But the drone war isn't over. There is another sighting at 2.30. Things grow tense as the military and civilian contractors continue to go about the long process of assembling and getting the multiple drone countermeasure systems set up and ready. There are no further sightings until 5 o'clock when Eddie Mitchell, a Brighton-based photographer who is parked on the runway with other members of the press, spots what he believes to be one of the drones. It actually turns out to be a Sussex police helicopter searching for the drone. But this of course doesn't stop The Sun from publishing the picture, which is actually still up on their website to this day. At 6 o'clock, yet more trucks arrive. 
arrive and it's starting to look like it's over. And it makes sense, because what sort of Bond level villain would have the brass balls to continue taunting Gatwick with a drone when every law enforcement officer within miles is watching for even the slightest unusual thing, not mentioning the counter drone hardware currently being assembled. But alas, another sighting is reported at 7.45 and hopes are dashed. Whoever it is has no fear of the police, the military, or the multiple drone killing super weapons currently powering up. At 9.30, Chris Woodruff, Gatwick's chief operating officer, announces that Gatwick will stay closed overnight due to continued drone sightings. At 10 o'clock, all drone countermeasures are now fully active, and any drone that comes anywhere near Gatwick will be pinpointed and neutralized with zero mercy. But they all detect nothing. Despite this, the drone is spotted one last time at 10.30 and doesn't appear again until morning. The superweapons appear to have been defeated. Day 3. At 5.58am on December 21st, Gatwick's runway opens again for the 10th time, and a flight from the West Midlands manages to touch down with no issues. Britain rejoices. The war of the drones appears to be over. However, a sense of defeat hangs in the air as the culprit has not been found, but is still hanging around. The drone appears again at 5 o'clock, prompting a final but temporary shutdown of the airport, and gradually things go back to normal. According to the police, there are several sightings over the following days, but with nothing being detected by the counter drone systems despite all the equipment being tested and found in perfect working condition, the airport stays open. After 33 hours, 175 sightings, of which 115 will later be deemed credible by the police, the drone war is over. As the police investigation searched for the culprit, they faced serious challenges. For example, besides the credible witness reports, there was no proof that any drones had been present. The few images which exist have never been acknowledged by Sussex police or anybody official. Due to this, the police had no evidence, no clues, and no leads. They only knew that someone had taunted them with a drone, that that person must have done so from a location relatively close to the airport, and that they likely were a skilled drone pilot. Due to their ability to weave between buildings and travel quickly while appearing and disappearing without a trace. Around 10 pm on the 21st of December, just a few hours after Gatwick is reopened for the 10th and final time, 15 armed police officers stormed a house in Crawley and arrest the married occupants, Elaine Kirk and Paul Gaith. A photo of the couple is leaked to the press and one day later appears on the front page of the Daily Mail with the headline, Are these the morons who ruined Christmas? Sussex police have been fairly cagey as to why Elaine and Paul were arrested so spectacularly, but it's suspected that they were simply arrested for being drone enthusiasts who lived nearby. However, on December 23rd, Paul and Elaine are released without charges after being locked up for 36 hours. As you can probably imagine, we are feeling, very, uh, feeling completely violated. Our home has been searched and our privacy and identity completely exposed. Our names, photos and other personal information has been broadcast throughout the world. We are deeply <laughs> distressed as are our family and friends and we are currently receiving medical care. They have an airtight alibi having both been working during the attacks. Also, although Paul owns a collection of remote controlled helicopters, neither actually owns a drone. Paul and Elaine later receive compensation from Sussex Police for wrongful arrest and false imprisonment. Later this day, Chief Superintendent Jason Tingley of Sussex Police admits that there's always a possibility that there may not have been any genuine drone activity in the first place. We cannot discount um, the, the possibility that there may have been no drone at all. Now facing mounting criticism from all sides, the press, the public and politicians, Sussex Police's investigation flounders on until September 27, 2019, when Operation Trebo is closed with police citing a lack of evidence and no reasonable further lines of inquiry. They later release a structured debrief that is heavily redacted and despite repeated freedom of information requests from the Associated Press have so far refused to release the redacted version on the grounds that the full report contains significant detail which should not be published for the reasons of national and operational security. I'm not trying to heap extra scorn onto Sussex Police here. All things considered, they took appropriate action, followed their contingency plans and worked with civilian contractors and the military to employ multiple counter and manned surveillance systems and, basically, they did everything they could. But at the end of the day, Sussex Police were not experts on drones. When drone experts did look at the details, they came to a similar conclusion to that Jason Tingley had hinted at, that there likely were never any drones present to begin with. 
Full disclosure, much of the following information comes from Ian Hudson, a drone activist of many years who runs the website UAV Hive. Ian has done a fantastic job of correlating all the facts regarding the Gatwick drone mystery. I'll link their page on airproxrealitycheck.org in the description of the video for anyone interested in further reading. Ian Hudson is just one of the many drone enthusiasts, hobbyists, experts, and industry leaders who have since dissected the events that occurred at Gatwick in 2018 and come to the conclusion that the official series of events provided by Sussex Police and the Department for Transport do not add up. Firstly, commercial drones in the UK come with pre-installed geofencing software that stops them from flying near airports and prisons, so the drone would have to be hacked before it could even take off the ground near an airport. Also, it was raining throughout the 33-hour attack, and most commercial drones struggle to fly in rain. This was especially true in 2018, let alone for long, long periods, while performing tricky and advanced manoeuvres like weaving between buildings. Of the few drones which were capable of performing the reported manoeuvres for long periods in rain, all were slow, large, and would easily be photographed by the many members of the press equipped with long lens cameras with night vision. We're on site within the first hour of the initial sighting. The only description anyone has ever managed to give regarding the drones is that they had a bright light on top. But drone experts like Ian point out that the LEDs which come attached to commercial drones are very weak. In order for the drone's lights to be seen by onlookers from as distant as 100 meters in the dark, it would mean one of two things that the assailant fit custom strobe lights to their drone, or the witnesses were seeing something else in the sky, like a helicopter, or a light on a distant crane, or one of the many airplanes and helicopters that were circling the airport, and assumed that they were seeing a drone. Like this picture, of course, which turned out to be a Sussex police helicopter searching for the drone. Eddie Mitchell was the first person to point out that if someone like himself, an experienced drone flyer and photographer who knew exactly what to look for, could mistake a helicopter for a drone, it seems likely that many of the other 115 reported sightings are also questionable. And then there's the various anti-drone systems set up in and around Gatwick. Either a large, brightly lit, custom drone outwitted every single one of them despite not knowing which systems would be used ahead of time, or the systems detected no drones because there were no drones present. Except for the ones being operated by Sussex Police, of course. Metis Aerospace, one of the contractors who had counter and manned aerial systems installed at Gatwick, hailed their involvement as an absolute win, saying the Skyperion system helped to provide assurance that the airspace was clear, allowing the 36-hour standstill to come to an end. This wording implies that Metis Aerospace were pretty confident that their system didn't detect any unusual drone activity because there was no drone activity for them to detect. Leonardo, who'd deployed their Falcon shield system to the RAF, were also confident that they had proved the complete absence of rogue drones, stating, From the point at which Falcon shield was deployed and operating, the RAF was able to report an absence of drones, enabling the airport to continue or resume operations. If we can then assume that the counter-drone systems were indeed accurate, it casts the police decision to ignore future drone sightings after the final shutdown in a whole new light. To quote Ian Hudson, it's reasonable to surmise that the penny had dropped with the police realising, thanks to the counter-drone capability, that there may never have been a drone. But it appears politically the narrative had run along so far that it simply wasn't an option to admit this to the public. But if there were no drones, then what the heck actually happened? There are several theories out there, the first of which is simple mass panic. According to this theory, perhaps initially there really were drones present, but as the night wore on, witnesses started misidentifying random things in the sky as drones, and things snowballed out of control. I don't like this idea any more than you do, but it's more than possible. Just a few years ago, in 2016, another drone scare where a supposed drone was claimed to have struck a plane at Heathrow actually turned out to just be a plastic bag. With so many people all staring at the sky above an airport and so many things being present in that sky, from circling airplanes to helicopters to police drones, it's entirely possible that witnesses were wrong about some or even all the sightings. This could explain how no videos or pictures of the drones exist despite there being so many press present at the airport, just a few nondescript dots in the air or pictures of police helicopters. 
This theory would also account for Jason Tingley's statement and the police decision to reopen the airport even though witness reports were still incoming. And of course, Metis and Leonardo's confidence that their systems had proved that no rogue drones were present. But if this theory is true, it would also mean that the police were aware that there were no drones, yet still wrongly arrested Paul Gates and Elaine Kirk and continued to investigate for a year at serious cost to the UK taxpayer. And that qualified witnesses such as airport staff and Gatwick police who were used to being in an airport every day suddenly started jumping at shadows and seeing drones everywhere. I find it a bit far-fetched to believe that so many qualified witnesses could have misidentified something and that the police could really believe that something was in the sky if it wasn't, so I tend to believe that there was something there. Anyway, Gatwick Airport and Sussex Police are still adamant to this day that there was something present in the sky being controlled by a malevolent operator who was determined to close the airport during a crucial period. Theory 2. Corporate Sabotage Due to the fact that the attack happened one week before Francis da Vinci Airports bought a controlling stake, 50.9% in Gatwick Airport, some theorists have suggested that the attack was actually orchestrated as a way of reducing the value of Gatwick ahead of the sale. This theory has some added weight as the sale was scheduled to go ahead just one week after the attack. But from what I can see, the sale went ahead. I'm not seeing anything to suggest that the new majority owners benefited from the attack in any way. There's no evidence that they bought their stake for a lower amount. And the new owners surely wouldn't want the negative publicity that this attack brought. Theory 3. A state-sponsored hack. In this theory, there was no drone. There was instead a hacker who temporarily disabled some or all of the airport's capabilities. Police were secretly present at the airport searching for the hacker when their drones were misidentified by airport staff and the drone story became the cover to avoid revealing that Gatwick had been a victim of a state-sponsored hack. And the theories get even weirder from here. The final theory is one of the least mentioned but also the most outlandish. That the Gatwick drone was in fact a UFO. Okay, a UAP then. I'm not suggesting that aliens shut down Gatwick airport over Christmas. That would be ridiculous, even for me. But if there was something present flying over the airport and eluding our best anti-drone tech, it would have to be something very cutting edge, perhaps even an experimental government drone or something truly, truly anomalous. Bruh. Like, I don't know, ball lightning. Surprisingly, this theory is a lot more convincing than you'd first think. In recent years, the topic of UAP incursions into highly secure military facilities has become more credible due to a series of articles about, and even admissions from, high-level members of the US government. There is also precedence for UAP sightings around commercial airports, such as the 2006 O'Hare International UFO sightings where, on November 7th of that year, 12 airport employees reported seeing a metallic object hovering over gate C-17 for over 12 minutes, before shooting upwards through the clouds at high velocity, leaving a clear blue hole in the cloud layer. The hole reportedly seemed to close itself shortly afterward. And it seems to me that if this sighting happened in 2018 rather than 2006, it would be reported as a drone rather than this. Just saying, there's some similarities here. There are of course a few other theories out there that I haven't touched on, but realistically, none of them can top aliens. So I'll end things here. With Sussex Police continuing to refuse to release the redacted report for Operation Trebo, and with no further clues, we will likely never know what truly happened over Gatwick on that day, and whether it was caused by a moron with a drone, a misidentification, a high-tech attack, aliens, Bruh. or just a plastic bag blowing in the wind. It will likely remain a mystery lost to time.